the catch up um, and see what was missed. Uh, I don't have my fancy banners and everything today because I'm not in my uh, studio at home, but I will share the link to our YouTube channel shortly. Okay, so just remember, just keep yourself on mute unless you have a question. If you do, please don't hesitate to come off mute and ask. Use the meeting chat or the raise hands feature as well. Okay, so today we're going to go through uh, some of the news items. Uh, last month, was, there were very few people who attended last month, so I'm going to be covering um, some of the news items that we had then, just because there's some really cool things that are coming out now, uh, some new things that have gone GA, which I want to touch on. We then also have Yaku, which has come through, who's going to show us some awesome Power Platform use cases. We're then going to jump into the community discussion, which is about mocking it up or mucking it up. So how do you plan your applications? What's the processes that you use? Any tools or tricks you can suggest? And then we're just going to have open discussions. Okay. Uh, let's jump in here quickly. Okay, so in the news, so we now have general availability for in app notifications for model driven apps. Now, this has been uh, in preview for a while. I think it was announced back in July 2021, so <laughs> quite a while back, but it's great to see that this is finally in uh, production. So GA, it's all there. A more known. You can start to see there the image of those coming up on the side while you're busy working in the model-driven apps. Um, we've also the new SharePoint uh, list image column type that is now supported by Power Apps as well. So this was a new uh, update that was made to SharePoint. We can now also support that image directly in Power Apps. So instead of you pointing to uh, a URL or anything else, you'll be able to pull that list through. And then there are also ways when you pull that in the different sizes for the image itself. So thumbnail sizes, uh, you've got small, medium and large, so you can adjust that as is needed and use it for uh, use it in your apps, depending on what you're looking at doing. This is quite nice for those who like to use SharePoint for their apps. Um, the public preview of the wrapper for Power Apps is now available. Oh, it's now public preview. Uh, what this means is you are able to take your Canvas apps and publish them over the various app stores. This uh, helps improve application development. Remember, just the one thing to be aware of, this doesn't negate the requirement for a Power Apps license. All it is essentially doing is wrapping that uh, application and giving you the ability to publish it on your app stores. You can distribute it through the likes of Intune or whatever MDM solution you are utilizing. Um, but this is nice because it just gives that, that extra flexibility when it comes to distributing it. You would still need to log on. You would still need a license associated with it. I think in March, we announced the public preview of doing the same thing with uh, portals. So now we can see this is coming down the line and we're making a lot of progress on this side. Um, there is a couple of links which you can use to uh, provide feedback. If you are utilizing this, Try not use it in production for any production apps just yet, but you want to share it with actual users and get their feedback and see if there are um, any things that they struggle with or anything like that. We do have a email address that you can send your feedback to. This will really help us make sure that when it does go GA, that it is successful. Okay, we've also got lots of guides on how to uh, wrap it and how to sign it, whether you're using Android or the iOS store, all the details are inside there, okay? Uh, if you are struggling with something, create a support request and someone will assist you, okay? Uh, the next one was the public preview of the Power Apps application on Windows. Now, for those who have been working with Power Apps for a while, we knew back in the beginning when Power Apps first launched, we used to have a Windows Store app. Now, I've gone too far. 
we used to have a Windows Store app that we could use to play our power apps. Uh, and we never used it for building it out, um, but this was really just to play it. But that one got deprecated uh, about two years ago, I think, where it got stopped being used. And then I remember we were having a conversation in one of these events a couple of months back on how we should be accessing it because we shouldn't really be going through the make.powerapps.com portal. David showed something where he was accessing it through one of the D365 landing pages. And now at least we're going to have this app within Windows that we can use to access all of our apps. And that was really cool to see. Um, we've also launched the Microsoft's Power Platform API. Okay, so as we know, uh, especially from an administrative perspective, trying to manage these tenants at scale has been a challenge, if, especially if you weren't using the center of excellence. Uh, there were lots of things that you needed to do, uh, whether it was PowerShell or some of the other administration features in order to get access to it. So what we've done is we've created a single API to give you access to the entire environment. I know this has been a request that's been asked for a long time. Um, so this is just going to give you that extra fl flexibility and control uh, to be able to control all of this from you. So this essentially, this API acts as a gateway or a single surface that harmonizes all the internal APIs from each feature area of the platform. So whether you're looking at governance or the environments or portals or licensing, you would be able to interact with all of those various components through the API. Uh, the other one that was also really great is the general availability for pay as you go licenses in Power Apps. So this is great. No more difficult licensing discussions. You can what you would do is associate your Power Platform environment with a tenant. Um, inside the environment, you just go and set up that you want to associate this with an Azure tenant, and then you get all the cost and billing info directly in your Azure cost center. So you would be able to see how many people are utilizing the app and what it does is it works on a month's basis. So if you've got, say, on month one, you've got 100 people using it, you get charged for 100 people. Month two, you've got 300 people using it, you get charged for those 300. And then month three, maybe you've only got 10 people using it, then you only pay for those 10 people. This is really attractive, especially when people are not quite sure on how many users are going to be making use of their app. They're worried about procuring too many licenses or they're not quite sure. This is a nice model to help get them started in that space. And I know this has been a request coming for a while, but it's completely flexible. Uh, based on your requirements. Okay, so that was it from me. I just want to check and see if there's anyone else that's got any news or anything to share that they've heard that was quite interesting lately. Yes, Michael. Um, so I saw that uh, Microsoft has released um, two little YouTube videos showing how uh, you can take a SharePoint list and make it a virtual dataverse table and take an the Excel, virtual connectors. Yes, and take an Excel sheet and make it a dataverse table, a virtual table. Um, in the past, um, we've shown how to do this with SQL tables and Cosmos DB, but these two are new. Um, and it's it's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's pretty interesting to kind of expose a SharePoint list as a Dataverse table. So essentially, if you have a SharePoint list, let's say it's got, I don't know, products or reviews, or you, you've got some data in a, some SharePoint list and you just want to keep it there, you've got some UI on top of it or whatever it might be. Uh, but now you want to you know, make this available to the Dataverse and relate it to other Dataverse tables so you can use it, um, then you can do that. It's it's and it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty cool. And my understanding is, is there's more on the way um, yeah. because it's using our general connectors for the power platform, you know, so it's using the normal SharePoint connector under the hood or the, the normal Excel connector under the hood. And so you couldn't imagine in the future just using generic connectors that we already have 
being able to expose that data as dataverse tables, even though the data stays where it is. Um, tell me, do you know if it impacts the delegation issues that you have with SharePoint lists? I don't know. I don't know. I haven't looked into okay. the detail of, of what's going on there. Okay, so that would be interesting to see. Um, I also saw something similar, the virtual connectors for Azure Active Directory as well. Yes, so, yes, that's, a, yeah, yeah, so, that's also another one. And that yeah, one, so I can, can I can, that I've already hit use cases several times where I've wanted to do that, where I've wanted to have a form and link to users in a model-driven app, mm -hmm. um, uh, Active Directory users, and you know, it's not like a Canvas app where you can, you know, there's just a control that does that, and a model-driven app, it wants to link to the user's table, which isn't everyone in Azure Active Directory. So yeah, yeah this, okay. that's pretty cool as well. Yeah, yeah, so Excel, Azure AD, and SharePoint are the three new ones. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, SQL uh, was there for a while, hey? Yes, and SQL was there for a while as like sample code to build your own, but the, the, the newest SQL one is using the SQL connector. Um, okay. So it's it's exactly like this video here. It's point and click configuration, essentially, to go and connect to any SQL table. Oh, nice. um, you know, Azure SQL, on-prem SQL, doesn't matter because it's using the SQL Power Platform connector. Okay. Yeah, which is pretty cool. And then it looks yeah. and feels like a dataverse table, but the, the data stays where it is. Oh, yeah. nice. Let's have a look and see. I'm assuming you would be able to build out the relationship mappings between the other dataverse tables and the SharePoint table or the Excel yeah. table. Yeah, yeah, 100%. That's, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Great, Mark. Um, Thanks for that. And then the other two things, there was another two things um, that I'm going to ask Mornay to share that he found, and I'm just prompting him to, to share them now because they're two pretty cool things as well. Mornay, are you there? Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm, I've got the flu, but I'll, I'll try my best. <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the one is the release planner that's available, and I'll post the, the link in the share. Um, in the chat window and the release plan that was pretty nice about it is you can see what this plan and, and what's being released. Um, you know, within the different, not just dynamics, but in, in the different power apps modules, right? So, so you can literally go and uh, view what's planned, what's released, what you can try now, um, and then also provide feedback on the whole process. You can even set up your own personalized release plan. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if My you're working. Plans. Yeah, if if you um, work with with customers, um, then definitely you know you, you can make that uh, uh, release plan available to them, uh, and you know uh, and and just filter out whatever uh, you require. Uh, let me actually share my screen quickly, and I can show you guys. it works and then the, the second part is um, an actual fact a component library uh, that I've also found that I thought is pretty nice with con different control uh, so for instance with this release planner like I said you can go and view uh, the dates or when it's available it also says when is early access public preview and general, okay. general availability right uh, some of them even have got little uh, video tips that you can click on and view it so it's very, very great, uh, awesome find. And then the next thing that I wanted just to share is this uh, controls called low coder. <laughs> and essentially what it is, it's got um, it's controls for uh, power apps. So you get different components. Uh, I think the ones I like is, is this uh, different uh, ways of viewing some of the components, you know, like the data visualization, you've got all these different charts. Um, and then at the same time, uh, if I just have a look here, uh, you know, you can also uh, have different visualizations on it. So you get UI components of different buttons, uh, form okay. creations, you know, all of the things that, that you would normally have to write either your own components for or HTML components for, uh, you know, it's included in here. I thought it's pretty nice find as well. Yeah, now, that is awesome. Uh, there's, there is, however, a pricing tier on this. So if you go to pricing, uh, you can sign up for a developer account that's for free. 
to play around with. And then there's okay. a light and a pro and ultimate. But I mean, if, if I look at the amount of controls that's available, and if I look at uh, what you actually get for those price, you know, it's pretty reasonable. And I think it's a great time saver, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because it can take a while to put these things together and make get them looking so good and working correctly. You end yeah. up saving a lot of time. Yep, no, definitely. And I, and I think for organizations, you know, that, that uh, need to have like a, a very quick and easy way to, to have uh, visually appealing applications. This is a great way just to quickly start with it, uh, you know, yeah. and then also uh, view the different controls. You know, there's date pickers, there's grids. I mean, people always like grids, you know, so you get all of these nice type of, of grids that, that's available. That's awesome. No, nice. shot for sharing, Mono. That is great. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, would you post a link to this? Uh, that's low code yeah. Dera. Okay, uh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. No, Mark's done it. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mona. I appreciate it. David, Thank go you, ahead. Guys. Thank you, everybody. Feel better, Mona. Yeah, and then I'm also very excited about the index function. So we no longer have to do last first to find Ooh. a particular. You can have give an index uh, or pass the, an index function onto a collection and you can just tell it to find one record for you. Oh, so that is quite cool. Yeah, it's going to save hundreds of hours by not, have, not having to type first last. Yeah, okay, that's quite nice. Awesome. Okay, perfect. Anything from anyone else? Okay, perfect. So. Next section, we've got the Yaku that's coming through. Um, Yaku, I think just uh, briefly introduce yourself to everyone. I'm sure not everyone's familiar with you, and then just take us through what you're going to be covering today. Thanks for your time today, man. Sure. Thanks, Jonathan. I'm just going to share my screen. Jonathan, your background looks a lot more realistic than than Yaku's, by the way. <laughs> this mine is a real background. <laughs> okay, let me just swap. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so just as a quick introduction, um, so my name is Yaku. I work for Microsoft um, as a customer success manager in the customer success unit. So we are we are helping customers as well as partners um, to focus on value realization and adoption um, challenges around dynamics in a power platform. So you know, if you have any customers, um, you know that needs help with. Uh, Getting that return on investment with the products that they've they've purchased, we are there to um, to help on that. And I do focus um, uh, specifically on on uh, FSI as part of my role. Okay, sorry guys, my machine has been acting up all day. So okay, great. So I guess one of the things you know you'll be familiar with um, in terms of your partners that that implement Dynamics or Power Platform is really these challenges that we have in building business applications, right? So, you know, there's typically the, the budget constraints, you know, there's time and resource constraints. Um, there's it's paper processes that needs to be digitized. Complex processes typically, you know, you you introduce the, something like the power platform in an organization and you've got all the shadow IT governance to think about, you know, to put everything in place. You have to think about, you know, evangelism of the actual um, platform that you put in. Um, you know, how do you go about the user adoption and getting the, the, the business to get that value out of the investment? You know, you, there's training to think about, you know, app in a day workshops, hackathons. So there's a whole lot of stuff to think about, even though you, you're dealing with a relatively simple platform in terms of low code, no code, um, or the power platform. So typically, you know, you go to your customers and um, you have your you know, you start talking about what it is that they want. You go into an envisioning session. 
you know, you, you do some design thinking, prototyping, whatever your, your sort of methodologies are that you've got in place. You know, typically there's an agile approach or something to draw up some rough sketches, convert that into something nicer, get the customer to agree to it, and then you start building it, right? But again, a lot of that time, even though it's it's a streamlined approach, it does still take a lot of time. And, you know, ideally you want something that you can reuse, right? And also a lot of the times the best ideas, you know, come from these citizen developers um, that's close to the business, um, you know, so if you could show them what's out there already, so understand what it is that the, the need that they have, and then potentially show them something that's already been done, and then almost do like a, a type of a fit gap um, with the customer to understand, you know, is that going to be a, a, a solution for them, you know, rather than building from scratch, um, you know, start w with something as a base. So again, I mean, whether you're working for a partner, a customer, I think the, the idea around this session is really just to show you the, the art of the possible for different um, industries um, um, out there. And I mean, if you work for a partner, you know, sometimes you can ask other partners, ask the community, you know, if you're a customer, go and have a look what's out there before you just start building and, and redesigning um, from scratch. So I really want to show you a few um, um, of the examples here. So again, this is this is just a sort of a drop in a bucket in terms of what there is in, in terms of examples out there and sources specifically around Power Apps. Um, and if you look at, I'm sure, you know, everyone will be pretty familiar with these kind of things, that the Power Apps documentation, case studies, success stories that's available, um, um, you know, to the public. Um, the community is building, uh, continually building some, some examples. There's GitHub repositories, um, you know, there's App Source. So all of these things are out there and it's really, really good. But don't just stop at that. Go talk to other people. Use this community, for instance. You know, if there's a next one and you have a scenario, maybe, you know, you don't have to say who your customer is, but sketch the scenario. Hear if anybody else has got it and has got any ideas around that and can point you to something that you can maybe use um, to go into those ideation or design thinking sessions with your customer. So typically what we see is sort of these three scenarios, right? Um, sorry, I don't know why this thing keeps popping up. So extending or simplifying existing scenarios, right? By making it mobile friendly, um, you know, using a, a simple interface or, a, you know, image capturing or something like that. So a lot of people will be quite familiar with that. Uh, you know, taking different line of business scenarios and processes and, you know, connecting them together um, uh, using something like Power Automate. Or, you know, another scenario is to come up with a new solution uh, that your customer is, is envisioning and then building that out for them. So that's that's typically the, the types of scenarios that we, we see in, um, uh, in Microsoft. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run you through a few use cases for a few different industries. Um, and again, these industries might not, I, I haven't specifically chosen the most um, popular um, uh, industries, but I've, it's just really to showcase the order of the possible around what's already been built. And a lot of these things have been built as sort of POCs and things like that within Microsoft, um, you know, just to show to our customers, you know, if you're an automotive customer and you're looking for a specific scenario, this is what we can do with the Power Platform. I've also, the, the, the scenarios that I've selected are fairly simple scenarios. In other words, typically an easy Canvas app or something like that, because again, you know, the idea is really to show that quick value, something simple that you can demo that's, you know, by taking a look at sort of three or four images, you can immediately get the idea around what, um, what the app is supposed to do. Okay, so the first thing here really is a, is a car parts com, um, companion. So it's typically something that's for a workshop engineer, um, you know, to, to look at um, those multiple complex steps when dismantling a vehicle, you know, or they have to use a, a set of paper-based processes. Um, then essentially what it does is, is to digitize that, that dismantling process and, you know, guide that 
that um, engineer through the process. So you can see, uh, you know, working on this this Merc, they can see when the vehicle came in, what the progress is on the on the actual vehicle. They can then say that they've started to work on it. Um, you know, the, there's a checklist for the person to go and check what what they've checked already. There's a little guide there to explain to them, you know, typically what they need to um, look at. They can put their comments in there. Um, they can go to the next screen. Um, you know, they can indicate sort of, you know, how much gas is left, how much oil is left, that kind of stuff. And then, you know, if there's anything that they need to sort of, um, uh, you know, take a photo of a specific part, they can do that using the camera control and then, you know, potentially um, find a particular uh, a part number or something by, you know, matching that um, based on a photo. So again, very sort of easy to understand for anybody that, that looks at a scenario like this. Um, the next one is, I mean, this could be, this is something most of you should be already quite familiar with is, you know, getting a, um, driving on our roads uh, and something hits your, your vehicle's um, front, uh, your windscreen, and you have to go and replace it, right? So these guys have built an app essentially for their, um, their staff to go directly to a consumer and then, you know, do the inspection of the, um, the vehicle um, screen. And then, you know, they can, they can replace, all the, again, all those cumbersome paper processes. So this could guide them as to, you know, how far they're away from, or how far there is somebody away from that customer, um, you know, to reduce the travel time, the petrol price and stuff to this, to this fictional company. Um, you know, when they get there, they'll have the details about the particular vehicle already captured for them. They can then, you know, capture the damage, or if it's a replacement, they can immediately just toggle that on. If there's anything they need to follow up on, they can do that. And then using, again, using the camera control, they can just go and take photos of that that um, camera, uh, uh, sorry, the damage that's on that windscreen. Again, very simple, but very powerful um, app that, that can be um, designed. And again, one of the things we, we want to call out is the power of, you know, the UI, um, and how flexible that would be using um, the Power Platform. So just changing gear into something different for retail. Um, so if we look at this, again, you know, these are all very much POCs that, that was done, but this is essentially a store helper app, right? So that helps that person in a day of a life of um, uh, somebody who manages a retail, retail store. So you can take all those operational tasks, um, you know, um, or any sort of request that needs to happen in the store, you can put in there and prioritize it and send out notifications. So if we look at this thing, you know, if this employer uh, employee logs in, they can see, you know, a, a nice menu um, of things that they need to, that they can do. They can then see a, a set of tasks that's available to, to for them to, to do. So, you know, cleaning a broken bottle in a specific aisle, you know, or they have maybe replacing some stuff in the salad um, bar if, if it's there. They can click through to the details, you know, in this example of the broken bottle. They can go and have a look and see, um, you know, what, what does it look like? So maybe you need, they need specific um, pieces of um, equipment to go and clean that. And also, you know, they can then choose to accept that, um, that uh, task. And also they can reach out to somebody else um, Another colleague, maybe if there's somebody else who needs to bring them, you know, a, 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 let's say a, a cleaning product or something, they can just then just go and, and tag that person and they'll get a notification to go and help them. And I mean, you can branch this out to say where exactly which all they're in, something like that. So for real estate, um, you know, maybe something like this property inspection um, app that, you know, if a property inspector comes out, um, you know, to do an assessment on a property. I mean, this thing is is pretty sort of endless in terms of what you can build there. But you know, you can capture the the, um, the details of the actual property. Maybe list sort of the the prices in that area for similar houses. You know, um, there's a, a meeting set up, and they need to capture the meeting date. Any sort of notes they've got there. If there's specific scores on a property that these real estate agents uh, would use, or even somebody from the bank who needs to go and inspect a property um, that's being sold, they can go and do a, you know a score rating on that. Again, use the camera control. They can take different photos of the the property and store it in there. 
provide that description of the actual property, you know, um, uh, and again, you know, back to that score, they can sort of put some notes around, you know, specific things to how that, that actually property scores compared to other properties and, um, um, you know, come up with a, a, a sort of a, a, a high or a low rating score based on that um, particular property. So something that, you know, I'm sure you've seen before quite a lot recently is some COVID-19 specific use cases, right? So something like this where, you know, companies are starting to go back to work specifically in South Africa. Um, you know, we're starting to open up again. Hopefully this will last, but, you know, you can actually, if you do go back to work, you can do a rapid screening so you can say, you know, when the date that you um, uh, expected to arrive and then, you know, if they, if you need to book slots for quite a big organization, you know, like a bank or something, you can see when the, the slots are available uh, for that rapid screening. You, you know, once you've booked it, you can potentially send out the confirmation to somebody, uh, you know, with the actual um, uh, scheduled arrival time plus, you know, a, a QR code that they can scan when they get there. And then again, you can see here that the other persona, maybe the scanner can do something like, a, a, a you know, if they've got a kit to, to do the prep or do the swabbing of the actual COVID-19 um, uh, um, uh, um, test that they need to do. And then, you know, they can track that whole process through, um, through, the, through this app. So we've actually done something very similar for an island in, in, in Europe where a passenger before they arrive in the country can do a booking and once they arrive in the country, they'll, there's, a, there's somebody waiting for them with an app very similar to this that then takes them through that process to, do, to give them a testing kit to, to, to link that testing kit to the passenger and send that off to the, um, uh, to the laboratories for testing, all done through Power Apps and, and Power Automate. Um, another example is something like this return to work for building access, right? So um, again, organizations um, that brings those employees back um, into your office um, can use this. Um, and, the, the, you know, you can provide things like a building layout, um, you know, make sure that there's um, social um, distancing is being adhered to, you know, control the number of people that's allowed inside the actual building because of COVID. Um, so all of that stuff you can sort of track here. So again, you know, you can the, the person can look at the availability of desks per floor, per building, whatever it is. They can see, you know, if there's any approvals that is needed, they can go and trigger that. Um, or if there's rules around, you know, um, it's automatic approvals, you can you can configure that. Um, and then you can see, you know, what's been approved. Um, and, you know, if you need to, somebody can validate that access again through a QR code. Um, so again, you, it's quite, there's quite a lot of um, potential for doing something like this, regardless of industry, anybody that's going back to work um, should be able to use um, something like this, um, this app. Okay, so then some cross industry use cases um, that I found that was actually quite, quite cool was, um, you know, an incident reporting at work potentially, right? So, um, and this was actually, again, something we did for a real customer um, in transports and logistics, um, you know, truck drivers um, that needed to report a work incident or an accident or something like that. Um, so what they can't do, uh, so what they do is, um, you know, obviously because of, depending on the country, you know, to avoid sort of lawsuits against them, or, you know, they need to provide some evidence about what happened, they can use this app, um, you know, to sort of indicate what, you know, where the exact injury occurred. So they can just click on this, um, tell us a little bit more about that, the specific injury, um, you know, was there anything like hospitalization um, that was needed, where, that they needed to go to, hospi um, to the hospital for an ambulance, and, you know, they can provide some, some um, uh, evidence, you know, like you can see at a photo or maybe like a scan or something like that. So all of this stuff can then be used by the, by the company as sort of um, um, to keep track of those incidents. Um, this is also, you know, something I, like a carpool app where, you know, it, um, obviously there's a lot of focus sort of these days on going green and things like that. So, and what's nice about this is if you've got a large pool of people um, traveling to the office um, when it starts opening up, you can actually say, you know, whether you are a rider or a driver, 
you can see a list of all your past and and um, next um, uh, carpool opportunities that's available. Um, you can, you know, again, similar, you can see where the sort of the driver is or, you know, where the person is that you need to pick up. And you can then get a full list of, you know, who's actually um, in that, that carpool for that specific um, trip that you're planning. Okay, so some smart buildings around, you know, smart parking. Uh, I mean, an airport is a good example of that, right? So, um, but even if you go back to work and you, you know, there's there's quite a complicated um, layout on your um, your parking. Again, you can see sort of what is the the available parking slots, and you know, in countries, and I mean, it's getting more um, uh, um, more popular here as well. If you wanted to see see you know which of those parking spots have actually got capacity for an electric vehicle, right? Or if you've got bigger or smaller um, uh, parking spots for based on a car size, you can you can sort of use that as a filter, and then you know. If you select your spot, you know you can attach it to a license plate and then validate and book that um, that that parking spot. Um, again, just uh, visitor management. I'm sure there's a lot of this this kind of stuff floating around, you know. But to make sure if you've got you know at a bank or something, if you've got a visitor coming, you can actually go and book something for that visitor, um, and then they when they arrive, they'll have something, and then maybe you can get a QR code scanned just to sort of ease the the process of checking in at the bank, um, you know, when you arrive there as a visitor. Um, this is a something that's also pretty cool. It's like a learning app that you can um, install in your organization. So again, you know, um, you can give it a, you know, a fancy name or something like that. So we've gone for this Champify, um, but, you know, it uses sort of dynamic, uh, sorry, Power Platform and SharePoint um, and you can then define a, a sort of a predefined learning path, you know, that indicate what kind of level you're on, you know, is it a beginner or is it like a hardcore, um, say, power app developer or something like that. And then this app could sort of guide you through the next sort of things that you need to do, right? So, I mean, there's a set of videos you have to watch and then there's a set of exams or whatever it is, you can you can sort of go and um, build that out for, for any organization. And, and again, it doesn't need to be Power Platform. It could be, you know, uh, an intern joining a, a, an engineering firm or something like that. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, time capturing, a lot of the um, partners here who are services organizations know, you know, daily time capturing, Customers want to see what you did. So again, it can be very simple, you know, just how much time did you spend on which task and link it to a, pro a, a, a project if you're working on multiple projects. So nothing fancy, but very powerful um, for something on a mobile app. Um, and then for financial services, um, I mean, this is actually quite cool. This is a, a an app that actually takes data from customer insights and then you know exposes it on a, on a mobile app so if you look at this um, example you know if if i was a, a banker i could see that customer 360 degree view of that particular customer you know what did i do their date of birth you know how long did that have they been a client what's their profile like their churn score uh, you know you can see here uh, the balances on their different products that they've got their credit scores um, you know, some insights on that particular customer, all of that stuff, um, you know, coming from that you can use from customer insights, you can then expose in a in a mobile app. Um, similar to this, you know, a, a financial advisor app that can show you again, you know, you've got your upcoming meetings, what phone calls you've got, you know, you can see the funds for, for a particular customer, um, any sort of events, you can see, you know, how, how they're, um, investments are doing, what kind of products they have, um, you know, based on on their investments. So quite a nice, um, simple app, but very powerful if you have that that customer um, you on your way to the customer or you've got the customer in front of you. Um, and then this is also very quite simple, just a call report, right? A lot of bankers have to do a call report after a meeting just to indicate what, what happened in the meeting, anything they need to follow up. And again, you know, you could, you could automate some of the outcomes of this and, you know, capture all of the company attendees or non-company attendees. That's that's part of that um, call report. And again, what we're seeing with this kind of thing is it's very similar across all banks. 
So once you've built one of these, you can almost you can take that and go and use it as reusable IP in most other banks as well. You'll you'll probably find something very similar to this. Um, this is just an example of a investment bank um, quote approval. So this is just an approval process, you know, that you can you can sort of trigger that process and send, um, you know, uh, one or many approvals based on different factors. So if it's a particular, um, you know, if it's being raised as a as a high risk investment, you might go through several steps, or if the price of the the in whatever they 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 um looking for um is is higher than a certain category again you might have to go through more conditions uh, sorry more approvals than you know if it's a smaller amount or something like that and then just one portal example you know sort of a mortgage portal so we've been playing around with the idea of just how complex it is to do um, you know, applying for mortgages and stuff like that in South Africa. And maybe it is an idea to go and build, you know, a portal that makes it easier for you to upload all that millions of um, uh, pieces of paper and evidence and all sorts of stuff like that um, and help the, whoa, what's happened now? And just help the consumer, but as well, um, oh, sorry, my screen has just gone nuts now. Um, and just help the actual bankers as well to, you know, to have all that information when they try and make the decision on giving a, a mortgage. Um, this is uh, Universal Bank, so I'm just going to skip through that. It's very similar to most of these other resources. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. And then last, lastly, one of the things I just want to show is this is an actual inspection app that was written by Standard Bank, and this is in the, uh, you know, in the public domain. So, but if you think about it, um, Standard Bank used to, you know, if there was any ATMs that needed to be inspected and stuff like that, it was quite cumbersome for them. So now they can send a, 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 an engineer out, they can give a description of, you know, any damage on the actual ATM, take photos of it, you know, request for, for different uh, um, people to come and help or even, you know, if they needed some replacement parts and stuff like that. So it, it saved them a hell of a lot of time um, to to actually by building this app. And again, you know, if you think about it, how many other banks can actually use this across, you know, um, South Africa or any other regions that do actually deal with um, ATMs? So that was me in a very, very quick nutshell, just to um, um, sort of give you some ideas of what can be done. And, you know, so hopefully it was... Um, something you found valuable. Awesome, Yaku, that was really great to see some really good looking apps there, hey? Sure. Um, are there any questions from anyone? Okay, perfect. Awesome, okay, so the next topic on the list, Jaku, really appreciate your time tonight. Um, thanks for presenting that content. It was great to see. Okay, so my is also just, just one some content around the um, templates as well. Sorry, Jonathan, yes, just one it. question maybe. So um, are any of these available somewhere or are these just pictures that uh, people can use to to create as ideas around what, you know, for apps in their organization or, or any of these available somewhere that, that people can access or download them? Um, unf so unfortunately, David, it is available for Microsoft. Um, you know, these are examples of what uh, Microsoft services or industry solutions have built. So the source code and things like that is available, but it, you know, we need to go through um, services to sort of request that because they own that IP. Um, it is really to showcase to to customers, um, but it is stuff that's that's already been built. It's not just pictures. Um, but unfortunately, you know, it's um, I don't think you'd be able to get that source code unless you work through somebody at MCS. Thank you. Okay, awesome. okay great. Um, let's just check it now. Okay, so the next topic is around the community discussion mock it up or muck it up and michael since you did such a great job introducing this last time do you want to go ahead and introduce this one again you are on mute mike oh there we go i'm no longer on mute am i 
No, can you hear you loud and clear? Okay, cool. Um, so I generally muck it up. <laughs> uh, but but the topic is um, there's a few aspects to it. I guess the first aspect is kind of like when you start building an app. Um, do you kind of create the the UI all working, looking beautiful, um, and kind of like connect it to dummy data, or you don't, actually don't connect it to data at all? What you do is um, you know, an app on start, you go and create a whole bunch of, you know, dummy tables of data and arrays and, and that type of stuff, collections, and then bind all your controls to this dummy data. So essentially, you get an app that kind of works, it clicks through, but it's actually not real in terms of connecting to real data. And this way you make sure it's functioning um, and you've got a great way of showing it to business and getting buy-in before you go and implement all the hardcore logic? Um, or do you build the app and make sure it's functional uh, in the way that it should function and then go and kind of pretty it up later on and, and go and apply your theme to it and style it and, and, and do all of those things? So I'd love to hear what people are doing and how they're approaching it. Um, so that's the one element. The other element is um, if you have to mock up an application, um, and you re truly do want to mock it up, um, what tools are you using to do this? Are you actually using Power Apps to mock up apps? Or are you using tools like fluidui.com to mock up an app, um, show it to business, get sign off, and then build it in Power Apps? Or are you using Power Apps actually to mock it up? Um, and I'll share a link to fluidui.com. It's a pretty cool website, and there's several like it. Um, and I just wanted to get people's feedback on on what they're doing and what's their approach and just see if there's a, a good discussion to have here. So anyone is welcome to come off mute and, and tell me how they're approaching it or tell us all how you're approaching it um, and what you're struggling uh, with or what works quite well, et cetera. Thanks, Michael. Uh, I think for... For us, the motto is pretty simple. So we first make it work, make it fast, and then we make it look pretty. So, so I think that's the best way to approach it, to make it work first. And then we look at the, the, the design and so on at a later stage in more detail. So that's how I would approach it. Yeah, I think it, it also depends on, you know, what are the the dragons, you know? So if it's a, if it's a pretty, simple app and there's nothing technically that's really scary you know then you could typically start with um the ui and but if, if you know that there are some dragons and some stuff that might come home to roost um it's also a good idea to start with those dragons and make sure that you you get those difficult things out of the way uh, before you spend too much time on the easy stuff um, so i think it's not a it's a, it's not necessarily a one size fits all um, it really depends on what kind of project and the requirement is. And also what is important for the client. You know, we typically like to ask the clients, you know, we can build you a Corolla, a Mercedes or a Bentley. Um, what does the budget allow? And if it's a Bentley, we have spent four or five months just on designing an app before we've written one line of code. But then obviously the, the budget was allowed for that to happen um, where that's not that's not always the case. So true, David. Um, just from my experience, I deal a lot with people in hackathons. So we run a lot of hackathons through our center. And the one trend I see coming through a lot is people designing the apps and the processes and the flows either in PowerPoint or in Vizio. So they'll work as a team together, build it out, get an understanding of what they want before they even start looking at the data sources or the app itself. And I find the guys that do that really well end up with much more complete solutions at the end of the hackathon. Um, so that's also one way to look at it. You could also use something like Fluid UI to design that interface, I'm uh, assuming. Yeah, I think from my side, there's also uh, depend what you're trying to, to achieve. 
if it's a, a quick and dirty, you just want to show the customer what's possible um, and how you can put this thing together, I'll just typically just do everything straight on on Power Apps and create it and make it to work and show the, the client with hard-coded data in it. But uh, we found that uh, trying to get that thing that even if you get it to work technically, to make it to fit a, a good looking design, mostly means you're almost rewriting everything. So uh, once you know what, what you're going to build, I'd say go for a design first, uh, depend on what the designer wants to do the design in, and then you start building it out visually first and then add the functionality at the back. And I think that's um, it's it's a bit of a dance between designers and the and the devs. Um, so what we typically do is once we have requirements, um, it will be handed uh, to the designer in Mint. That's typically me, and I'll put it together in Figma, in terms of how it should flow and how it should look. Um, and then we go through a kind of a demo situation with the dev who might say to me, you know what, rounded corners on this particular control is very difficult. Can we change that? Um, or this flow to that flow because of how we're using the data is not going to work so well. Um, and eventually we come out with a proper prototype that is clickable, that we can show the customer that is doable in Power Apps, which is an important part. Um, and then the dev can just take that and run with it. Uh, if I remember correctly, there are also templates or stencils available for Figma for Power Apps. There is for Teams. I'm not aware of any for Power Apps. I think I've, I've seen that before. I've, I've used it a, a while ago, if I remember correctly. I think it was Figma. But but yes, I think that what, what Tian said as well is it also, it again, again, depends on what the kind of app you're building. And if you can split the logic and the the ui as much as possible you know that's always that's always a good idea because then you can um you can build either the ui or the the functionality without rework uh, but the moment you you almost want to use the word hard code the app too much you know then it, it becomes um challenging to to update under the ui or the functionality later and then it becomes a quite a, a significant rewrite So yeah, they component um, libraries are your friend. Yeah, um, David, I also have uh, one thing to add there. I also feel like um, experience has a has a, pl a, a place to play here, because I feel like when you have been experienced in building these apps, you you feel like you know what to do. So you, you deal with things like um, make it look pretty first and <clears throat> the UI and stuff. Um, for people who are more newer to the to the game, you try and obviously try and deal with those dragons first because you feel like <laughs> if you can't get that right initially, then you're going to struggle, um, you know, after some time. So um, once you're a bit more experienced, um, like myself, after building a few apps now, I'm, I can already play around and say, well, I know this will go there, this is going to do this, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not too concerned about um, <clears throat> too many dragons, but uh, initially I would first, you know, see, can I do this? Then after that, and then I try and make it um, look a bit pretty in terms of UI. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the it's. Other question, you know, the other Sorry. question is also, um, it, I feel like there's been a, a sort of a general acceptance as well, or more of an acceptance lately that look and feel is not as important as functionality. Um, the app should do what it needs to do. And the look and feel, sh I think, has gone to people want to keep it as clean as possible. And um, but but mock up and, and as much branding and who knows what next on top of that has felt like people have accepted that that should be secondary. So how this looks is not as important as it should do what it needs to do. Yeah, I think that that depends on the client and, and the project. Um, you know, it's typically if, if the client wants to spoil the users, and and we we ask we ask the clients that we say like for for this app, do you want to spoil your users or do you want to give them something to do their job? Um, because if you if you if you really want to spoil them, and then it's it's uh it, it does take a quite a quite a bit of planning to do that properly, and also it's in it's unbelievably important to make the client understand that 
we're not going to go through the entire project and then at the end when we five percent away from sign off then they say okay but now let's give it to our design team and now they come back with 400 requests and to, to make this thing look pretty because it it doesn't work like that um so i think it's also you know to make sure that the the, the customer whether it's an internal business department or an external customer understands what it is that we we busy building and whether the design that we're using right from the start is sort of a benchmark for wh what this thing is going to look like in the end. Um, because, you know, the moment you start saying, well, let's change the colors, that that's typically not a big issue. But if you now want to implement different logos and sizes and now it needs to be responsive on different on, on different devices, you know, then it's, it's a completely different project. And uh, top of from what you mentioned earlier, you know, from experience, it's it's like you said, that's making sure that you ask those questions right up front, um, because if 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 those discussions only surface at 95 percent of the project, then you you're in for some difficult discussions. I think also just from my side that the. This is nothing new and it's nothing new on Power Apps, definitely, but it's easy to get a project to 80%. And typically we see that a lot where people jump in and they start building apps and it's quick to get that thing to 80%, but sometimes it's impossible to close it off if the architecture wasn't done properly. Um, you know, so I think it's people tend to start with the stuff that they know, you know, so they want to do the easy stuff first, make it look pretty, do this and do that. Uh, but when it comes to the hardcore thing that's actually going to make this project a success, if you leave that to, to the last part of the project, then typically you, you run quite a bit of a big risk. And there is important to understand what the key success factors for the client is in the particular project and, and how important look and feel is versus functionality. Oh, but I like your comments about spoiling. I think that's a nice way of looking. Yes. I like that a lot. Um, spoiling is is the nice to have, but sometimes nice to have is for for some people is an absolute requirement. So um, I like that the, the way of looking at it. Spoiling. Um, I also like the comments. I think that everyone is saying is um, basically think about this <laughs> before you start. Um, cause it's easy just to get stuck in and start assembling something, but maybe spend a bit of time contemplating this with your business users who are ultimately going to use it or your customer or whoever it is and come to an agreement of how this will be approached uh, and how important this stuff is and what it will look like at the end or at various kind of points in it, uh, or do they want in the first few days because apps should take weeks, not months. In the first few days, um, you know, do they want to see a, a mock-up of it, of it working in some other tool so they get a get a sense or not? Or you know, so I guess it's you know, touch, pause, 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 <laughs> and then engage, <laughs> something like that. Uh, and Manuel's got his hand up. I guess another one that is interesting. Just uh, I'll I'll I'll. Uh, uh, switch to you now, Manuel. Um, but um, the other one is, where do you get your inspiration from? You know, not for life, but for your apps. So I'm rubbish, so I just go and copy lots of other things. Um, so I go and like all the ones that Yaku just showed. Now I go, mm, that's an interesting layout, and that's I like that idea. I like how they're doing that grid or whatever it is. Um, so just a follow-on question after uh, Manny's gone. Um, yeah, where do you get your inspiration from? Uh, okay, so over to you, uh, Manny. Yeah, I think one of the questions you also need to ask is, is there a trade-off on one or the other, depending on what they want? So if there's a look and feel or a design component that they'd like to change, but you'll be trading off functionality for that, those are the questions that need to be asked. Will this design change affect something from a functionality perspective? Because that's then, like David says, when you're referring to spoiling the users versus making or let, giving them something to do their job, that's where that question comes up. So if if there's a significant design change which could affect functionality, then that question is 
even more sort of prominent than, than before. So that's maybe just something to keep in mind going forward is, is when that question is asked, if it's going to, if there's going to be a trade off, then you need to decide what, what is the, the most important part of that app. Awesome. And then, Mark, you had a question around uh, how, where do you get your inspiration from? Yeah. Oh, it's, I must say, some of the people that we have in these sessions, some of the other people presenting other content, I like to see what other people do. I'm lucky because I get to see a lot of apps that people build, so it helps give me a lot of ideas. Perfect. Susie's got a comment here. UX and UI are spelt differently, um, often treated as the same thing, but not so. Yes. I've no idea so what that means. Please tell us and give some examples. <laughs> so I think this is a very common problem, but when you guys are all talking about you prioritize form over function or function over form, um, you talk about you know changing the colors or you know, maybe you want a nice swish in the corner. That is UI. So if you're talking about colors and what it looks like and how appealing it is, that's UI. When you're talking about UX, you're talking about the interaction of each element and how you interact with the actual app. That is completely separate from UI. So UI and UX cannot exist alone. They exist together, but they are separate things that have to be dealt with separately. So I would agree that sometimes making it look fancy should be secondary to making it work well, but making the user experience in interacting with that app um, is paramount to the success of that app. So it could function perfectly, but if the users are having a frustrating time actually making it work or using it or interacting with it, it might as well not work because they are not going to adopt it. I like absolutely it, I like agree. It. So, 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 what would be so? Like, this is sometimes what happens when I'm building apps. Now, mostly when I build apps, there, they are generally concepts. They are they're working concepts. So, the stuff I build never really goes into production. But for example, I'll get to a point and I say to myself, so, I need to create a a, a new a, a new input form. So, I need someone needs to capture some data. Should I have that as something that slides out from the right hand side of the screen and is quite narrow and they just fill it in there and the rest of the screen kind of goes darker gray uh, and you can't click that um, or do I go to a new screen um, and they have a complete uh, form like probably maybe it's the same size but it's in like the middle of the screen um, and then when they complete they go back to the previous screen um both are functional they'll both give you the same result they can both fill in the data uh but the experience is different so is is that a a ui thing or is that a ux thing or does it matter that is a ux thing so how the user actually interacts with the app that you're building is the user experience so if they click this button you have five options of what to present to them. How do you present it? In what format? Do you allow them to get back to the previous screen or not? Do you gray out what they can't use? Um, do you highlight what they should be looking at first? Uh, um, it's all about patterns and practices and how you present the data to them and where you take them next. Is it what they expect? Is it not? Um, that is all UX and it can all be bright pink with purple. Um, if you want the, the entire experience to be amazing, you have to put UI on top of that. But we're not talking about function at all here. Obviously, it has to work um, to yeah. com complete the experience. Yeah, I get you. I get you. And, and that's the piece I struggle with. I'm, I know I, I'm not very good at, you know, should it be a rounded corner or, you know, should I use an icon instead of a button? Um, um, I, it's more like that, that thing that I was explaining there. Um, and and the flow of how you navigate between actions and activities and delete rows it's it's that's the stuff that i generally struggle with of what's the what's the best approach um 
Uh, and generally, I just go and copy other apps. I literally open my phone and I look at how CRUD operations <laughs> work on apps on phone. I go, that's a cool way of doing it. I'm going to do it like that. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, and I think it's typically it's it's quite challenging to change UX afterwards. So that needs to be, you need to sort of decide what the layout of the app is going to be up front because that's not, you can still change look and feel and these sort of things, but to start changing away um, in the UX in an advanced stage of the project is quite, quite challenging. And always, you know, people seem to think that because it's not code that we're writing in Power Apps, um, and it's, we're not writing JavaScript or .NET or whatever. But at the end of the day, you still need to plan. And if you if you don't plan on Power Apps, you're just going to get yourself in a pickle quicker um, than in in some some hardcore development platforms. But you still need to go through that planning exercise. Otherwise, you're just setting yourself up for hiding. Any other comments, views? I like the segregation of UX and UI. Now that I understand, I think. <laughs> this is good. Awesome. I think this was a great discussion. I think it's had the most input out of all of the topics that we've had so far. So thanks everyone for getting involved. It's always nice to hear what everyone else is thinking and feeling and what they're doing. Um, I think that brings us up to the end. Unless, David, you've got an awesome tech tip that you can show us quickly. I don't know if you've um, prepared one for today. Yeah, it is It is quite quick, so I think it's appropriate. Um, let me share my screen. How are we doing for time? No, we're like, still fine. We've got like 15 minutes until half past five. Uh, excellent. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So what I want to show you is if you're building a Canvas app, um, it's quite easy to get into the data. Typically, if you use Sh uh, SharePoint or you know Excel, which you really shouldn't, but if you use Excel or SharePoint, it's quick to get into the data and, and to see what it looks like um, and then to, to, to build the app around your data per se where if you're using Dataverse and model-driven apps, um, initially it might feel like it's not that easy to get into to, to actually see the data. And what I'm going to show you is um, a, a very basic model-driven app, and there are some records in here. Now, if I open up this record, uh, it's got very basic info on it. But if I wanted to see the back end, if I actually wanted to see what this record consists of, um, all the other fields, to get an understanding of what other values are set at fields that might be hidden on this form or, or whatever the case may be, it might feel like a, a bit of a, a black box. And if you go into the design of the app, so if you go into tables, you'll see that there is my expense table. And then you've got data over here, which, which might give you some of it. So you can go and say, change this to all columns. But then you end up with this very wide column and you have to scroll and scroll and so on and so forth. Um, so, so what we found is, and what we use quite often, is the actual APIs. Um, now, the moment that you start talking about APIs, you might feel like, wait a minute, that's not really what I signed up for. Um, but the truth is that a web browser can also be used to view APIs. So what I'm going to show you is if I wanted to view this record, um, in, in the back end, I could simply go and copy the ID of this record in the URL. And you can open up the environment forward slash API forward slash data forward slash V. Well, currently it's on 9.2. So you can go and uh, access that table directly in the API in the browser. And just the name that you use for that, if you go and look at the table name, you'll see that there is expense. So it's UKUSOL underscore expense, and it's the plural of that. So it'll be UKUSOL expenses. And if you hit that in the browser, this actually issues a GET request to the API, 
and there you can see all of all of the data for all of your records. Um, so this is a very easy way to go and check what the values for this record is, other than what you can see on the on the front end or on the form. So if you have any questions at any stage, please you know pick up uh, or unmute yourself and interrupt me at any time. Um, no issues with that. So from here, the awesome bit is you can also go and issue some some commands, or and if you've used uh, Power Automate expressions before, it's it's very similar to that. So if, for an example, I wanted to just go and look at the, or I want to go and filter this data set to only include the ones, or I want to look for a specific record, I can give it a question mark to pass it a parameter, and then I can actually tell it dollar filter, then this is exactly the same as you would write in Power Automate. So if I go and say ikusol uh, underscore name space equals, then single quote, test space lunch, single quote, if I had enter, um, why didn't that work? Because I spelled lunch incorrectly. So there we go, the, it, it'll filter this data set and it'll only return the, the one record that I filtered it for. You can also go and do, um, you can count the set. So if you add, um, if you say count equals true, I'm going to end it like that. Is it count rows or count? I can't remember now. I'll check in the docs if I, if I open it now. But then you can actually, it can count the, the content for you as well. And you can also go and do expand columns and, and so on and so forth. So this is a very useful useful method to just view the, the backend data. If you know what the ID is for this, this actual record, the one that you're looking for. So let's take, just copy that. You can also go and simply put it in brackets behind the the expense name, and you'll see that this is similar to how you interact with um, data and, and tables in Power Automate if you wanted to go and set certain values. All right, so this, that's one way of doing it. Um, I'm going to post a, a link in the chat um, that's got more information on this. And you'll see that this talks about the web API, but you don't need Postman or anything like you, you can just use a browser the way that I've explained it over here, which makes it quite a bit easier. So let me put that in the chat and then I'll show you something that's that's a little bit easier or even easier uh, than that. Right, so if you're in the application, you'll see that at the top at the right hand side, there's a little um, picture of like a rocket ship robot thingy. My eyes are bad, so I can't actually see what that, that is. Uh, but if you click on that, you'll see this open opens up a an add-in called Level Up for Dynamics uh, 365 slash Power Apps. Now, this has got a whole bunch of very, very powerful tools. Um, so one of it is to just view all the fields. And if you click on that, it's going to basically render that record in a in an HTML screen or page for you and you can then go and see all of the values for all of the fields um, in that in that record which is hugely useful um, so I strongly recommend there's a lot of other stuff this actually this tool in itself justifies a full session on its on its own uh, I would recommend you go and download and install level app for dynamics and go and play, play around with all of these different different t uh, t uh, tools or uh, or functions within the tool. Um, so yeah, go and play around with it. And uh, if you have any questions, you feel free to come off mute. So that's a free tool. Eh? You can just go download it from somewhere. Yes. So, so you can just go and search for um, Level Up Dynamics, and it's got it for Chrome, Edge, and Mozilla. Awesome, David. That is great. Thanks for sharing. What, what does God Mode do? Um, so it gives you access to everything on that form. So. Uh, it's got things like logical names where you can display all of the, the logical names for all of the fields on the form. Um, you can blur the fields. So if you want to take a print screen 
and send it into support or do user documentation or whatever the case may be. You can blur the sensitive information. God mode will actually give you access to um, to everything that's on this form and unlock it for you. So yeah, this is oh, uh, maybe we should just do a full because it's got a lot of stuff that you can do with this um, do with this app. Um, maybe we should do a full session on it to take people through it. Yeah, definitely worthwhile. Looks like it can be quite cool. But awesome, David, thanks for sharing. You've always got some great tips and tricks to share. So I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Okay, so we're coming up to the end. I just want to open the floor to everyone to see if there's any general questions or things you would like to talk about or mention before we close. Okay, perfect. So with that, thanks everyone for your time. Yaku, really appreciate your time this evening. So thanks for presenting it. That was great. Um, I hope you all have a fantastic evening and we'll see you all next month. Thanks everyone. Have a great day further. Thanks everyone. Cheers. Thanks everybody. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye. <clears throat> bye, bye. Thanks all.